Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm sort of wearing two hats at once, which is slightly sartorially challenging. Um, I'm here as um, director of the Brass Research Centre, but I'm also one of the principal investigators with the Sustainable Places Research Institute. So I'll say a little bit about both of their research agendas and how they relate to this issue of um, innovation and green skills and really creating sort of greener communities and a greener economy. Um, just to say a little word about BRASS. The BRASS research agenda is, is based around three broad themes. The first is sustainable consumption and production, which touches on many of the um, items within Terry's um, diagram there. Um, also talking about the social, uh, socio-environmental impacts of business. So everything from environmental justice, issues of pollution, contaminated land, down to things like nanotechnologies and the impact they have in both environmental and potential health terms. Uh, and also responsible management thinking. And a lot, of, a lot of that is about what we might call you know, the soft innovations that we will require to create more socially responsible and more sustainable business, whether that's innovation in business education, whether that's innovation in terms of leadership and uh, other forms of management skills, whether it's innovation in particular disciplines. So we do work in the marketing discipline, for example, the accounting discipline, um, economics as well, looking at really innovative ways of understanding, measuring, learning about, teaching about issues of business sustainability and social responsibility. Um, I picked out two in red there, which kind of social enterprise and sustainable communities, um, which will, will form a bit of a focus of what I'm gonna go on um, to talk about. Two very interesting areas, and, and in many ways, the sustainable communities work for us was very much a bridge um, really into the Sustainable Places Research Institute, because um, Brass's work began in sustainable communities really by looking at the role of um, small businesses in helping to create more sustainable communities. And that, that led really into a broader interest in sustainable communities and, and a, it, it, to some extent a defocusing of our agenda a little bit. And increasingly our sustainable communities work um, has moved more over towards the Sustainable Places Research Institute. So just to say, uh, 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 say uh, the Sustainable Places Research Institute, or PLACE as we tend to call it, Cardiff goes for absolutely five letter acronyms at all costs. Um, I, really wanted, I really wanted this to be called SPRINT, because I thought SPRINT was an acronym with really good, which would have been the Sustainable Places Research Institute. But unfortunately, the university couldn't handle six letters in an acronym for a name. So we, we, we end up with PLACE, which is still good, but not quite, not quite as much fun to be had in terms of the puns, which I enjoy. Um, I was involved in a very early meeting nearly, ooh, nearly 20 years ago, actually, when for the first time within the university, representatives from the different schools um, came together to talk about the issue, at that time, just the environment. And it was about what are we doing in the different schools about the environment. And it was a very funny meeting, actually, because it was one of these sort of meetings where everybody from all the different schools said, well, we're doing this. And everyone, went, well, everyone else went, are you? That's really interesting. I wish I'd known about that. And going around the table, what we discovered was that Cardiff, unusually, had real strength in depth on research um, across a whole range of environmental sustainability-based disciplines, whether it's philosophy, journalism, engineering, architecture, you know, biosciences, even the business school. Um, we all had real expertise there, but none of it had been joined together. And really, ever since that meeting, for nearly 20 years, we've been kind of almost searching for a vehicle to bring together that very diverse interdisciplinary strength um, that Cardiff University just, just almost by coincidence happened to have evolved to bring it together to give it real critical mass and to really take advantage of that. And um, when uh, the competition was announced by the university to um, put forward a proposal for a, a new sort of centre of excellence, a research institute on any theme you like to choose, um, you know, we, Terry and I discussing this really saw this as an opportunity to finally knit together that tremendous strength that the university had. And you know, we've actually ended up bringing together um, researchers from 11 of the university's schools. So it's, it's quite a tremendous feat to get all those different disciplines together um, in, into one unified enterprise. And, and the logic really is this idea of place um, as a unifying theme, that pretty much all the sustainability research we do, well, maybe not all, but a great deal of the research that we do has some kind of a place theme, which gets us into well, what do we mean by place. And, and place is quite interesting because it can be the obvious things. So it, um, it could be the natural places, the forest, national park, a river basin, a coastline, a mountain range, which are the sort of earth scientists, the biosciences, maybe think in terms of those very natural places. Um, it's got the sort of urban places, the city regions, which um, you know, the, the geographers, the town planners, maybe the architects think 
a, a, a bit more in. And rural places is quite interesting, where the kind of natural meets the, um, the, the sort of man-made. Then you've also got maybe a more abstract set of places. I mean, neighborhoods and communities. But then it gets down to buildings um, and even organizations. You know, an organization is a place which allows the business school um, uh, 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 that tends to deal more in kind of these abstract concepts of organization to be involved and to bring their strengths and sustainability to bear in the place enterprise. And just to show you that bottom diagram, now you might think as a place, that's about a city. Um, and in some ways you'd be right, but where that photograph is taken from is actually from inside um, an urban food market. It's, it's food that's been grown as a kind of social enterprise within the city, which is then being made available for sale for local residents. So although you're seeing a geographical place there, you're also seeing this abstract idea of, of a place as an organization. So place is quite a neat concept. It, it does really allow us to um, talk about sustainability in, in, in a variety of different ways, from, from the almost global right down to the very local, to a single building, a single organization. So it really brings together all the different interests of the university, or, or you know, many of the different interests of the university, in a nice, neat, and coherent way. Um, so it'll be, it'll be really the community is what I'm going to focus on a little bit today, because I think often it's within trying to develop sustainable communities um, where the issues of skills and innovation maybe comes together uh, most notably. In terms of the, the key research aims for place, I mean, it's this idea of sustainable place making. Um, and as Terry's already mentioned, this idea of transitions, adaptations towards really a, a much more of a low carbon, um, relocalized, more sustainable economy. Um, the various different sort of themes that we've picked up um, for the research agenda for the center deals with a whole range of things from um, this idea of the city uh, rural regions that Terry was mentioning down to sort of health issues like healthy and connected communities. And it, it brings together disciplines in ways which maybe seem terribly obvious to outsiders, but to academics um, is maybe not that natural. Um, so for example, one of, the, one of the lines of work that's been done within um, place is, is carrying on a, a sort of um, collaboration between city and regional planning um, and, and the School of, of Health, um, looking at the role of planning and buildings and the way in which we actually organize our communities on health. Now that might seem tremendously um, obvious to other people that you know, the buildings people live in, the way in which they're organized, the way in which transport routes are set out um, in, in relation to residential areas will determine things like whether people walk or whether they drive, which in turn affects their health as well as the sort of sustainability of their lifestyles. But it's very unusual to get sort of town planners and health people together. It's not a natural fit in many ways. And yet, you know, we've done it here in Cardiff. It's led to some very innovative, um, very successful projects which are being carried on. So it allows you to look at some of these issues maybe in very different and innovative ways by bringing those different disciplines together. So just to talk a little about, a bit about sustainable communities and the sort of sustainable communities work that we've begun with in Brass, but which is in many ways being passed over um, to place to a large extent. Um, really, the idea behind sustainable communities is creating these you know, places where people want to live and work now and in the future. And this is from the, um, the offices, Office of the Deputy Prime Minister, this idea of place making based around this sort of wheel um, of, of what would make an attractive place. And if you go around the outside of the, of the, of the wheel there, you know, we would all like to live in somewhere that's sort of well run and well connected and well served, that's you know, environmentally sensitive, uh, fair for everybody, thriving. Um, well-developed and built, active, inclusive, and, and safe. It's all stuff that I think, yes, we can aspire to. I guess the, the big question is, you know, how do you deliver that? And how do we go from that sort of aspiration of the type of places we'd all like to live to create actual sort of practical communities um, that actually sort of thrive and run? And we were um, uh, successfully bid for a project funded by the ESRC and the Academy for Sustainable Communities on looking at the roles of particularly skills and knowledge and leadership um, within sustainable communities to help to, to make that transition towards sustainable communities um, as described there. And very much about looking at, you know, can we take those skills maybe that are learned elsewhere, apply them in different communities and help to develop more sustainable ways of living and lifestyles within different communities. And, and particularly, I mean, a lot of our interest was, can we apply those lessons within Wales? It was a UK national project, but we were very interested um, in a Welsh dimension. The project's aims were to develop this innovative and this intera interactive approach to understanding you know, those how issues of how, you know, we know what we want in terms of sustainable communities, but how do we make progress towards it? 
and come up with some kind of model that would help to really give the context for what sort of skills, what sort of training, what sort of approach to knowledge um, do we need to help communities that maybe have an aspiration to become, whether it's transition towns or just in, in maybe a, a small scale um, uh, way, more sustainable as communities. And particularly looking, and, and again, Terry talked about these kind of key areas, energy, food, home, and transport. I mean, we know from research that's been done, like the environmental impacts um, of, of a products project that was run on a European basis, that you know, the average European citizen, like you or I, 75 to 80% of our impact on the planet as individuals comes really from the food we eat and where it comes from, how it's cooked and how it's thrown away, um, how we move about the place, whether to and from work or to and from work or for pleasure and leisure, um, really how we run our homes, how our homes are constructed and how they're run, particularly in terms of energy management, to some extent also water management and the energy using devices within them. So, you know, if we could crack those, those four spheres, really, in terms of making those substantially more sustainable, I think we could take a real big step towards uh, more sustainable communities. And then the, the cross-cutting theme across all those different spheres, we were looking for, well, how do you get greater in community engagement? How do you get people to join in with these things as they're developed? So that, that was the sort of scope of the project. Um, it was based on a model, and I won't go through this, it's a very kind of complicated model, um, which uh, uh, was originally from community regeneration, but I think looking at it, we thought, well, in terms of developing sustain more sustainable communities, it's much the same approach that's needed. And really, it's the idea of breaking skills down, that you maybe have these very, what they call specific skills, which are almost the technical skills, whether those technical skills are, you know, how to run a community bus service, or whether it's, you know, how to compost and recycle, whether it's how to cook food and use it in a more sustainable way. Um, whether it's how to develop more sustainable products and, and more sustainable business models. There's more kind of almost technical skills, the specific skills in the center there. But around them are other types of skills, these more strategic ones, which are maybe about um, things like strategy and leadership, almost the sort of political um, dimensions of maybe setting up businesses, getting them run, getting them supported within communities. Um, process skills, which are much more about things like change management, things like working with partnerships, developing the networks, that particular um, innovations and initiatives need to, to succeed and to thrive. Um, and then practical skills, which are really the idea of, you know, whatever type of organization you're, you're managing, you will need certain skills to make it fly, um, whether it's managing staff or volunteers, whether it's organizational development and planning and such like. And one of the areas I've been involved in over the last few years is social enterprise, which I flagged up at the beginning. And um, it's interesting the extent to which, you know, there are, there are some fantastic things going on in communities all across the UK in terms of social enterprise. But they often have problems with some of those practical skills, whether it's marketing, whether it's financial planning, whether it's budgeting, whether it's quite the complicated mix they have. Of, of, they're often organizations that have a mixture of paid employees and volunteers, which is a very tricky um, human resources management challenge, which many of them struggle a bit with. So you know, there are a range of practical skills that organizations trying to move towards more sustainable communities really need to, to master. And, and so we were looking really at the skills challenge from that, that you know, quite broad and multi-dimensional perspective. The key community we actually got involved with wasn't a Welsh community, because I said it was a UK national project, um, it was with Stroud, because Stroud's a really interesting town, lots of stuff going on. There's a, you know, they're one of the towns that's really taken sustainability issues to, the, to their hearts. Um, they're, they're sort of a transition town, fair trade town. They've got a very active let scheme, local um, trading scheme going. They're actually on the Coastal Towns Association. I've been to Stroud, and it seems a long way from the beach, <laughs> from what I remember. But I suppose if you work on the basis that like the river eventually becomes the coast. But <laughs> anyway, I think they're basically, if, if it's there and it's to do with sustainability, Stroud will join it, basically. They're great joiners. And what we also did, as Terry also mentioned, that over the years we've been collecting case studies from around the world about successful um, initiatives from different communities. We started taking some of those, um, uh, uh, those examples and trying to develop a sort of database of examples, analyzing what made them work, what lessons could be learned from them around the world. And it was some cases to do with energy, um, quite a lot to do with food because, you know, Brass has done a lot of work on local and sustainable food, building a lot of the stuff that's been done within city and regional planning. Um, and also about things to do with the home, about both the sort of construction of homes um, and the management of homes. So, for example, we did the um, uh, the waste trials um, for Cardiff in terms of different methods of uh, managing household waste. But we also took that opportunity to look at the way in which kind of material flows as a whole through different households. Um, and then transport. I mean, the particular 
case we looked at was the Stroud Valley's Car Club because they had a very active car sharing club going, but we looked at some other ones as well. So we, we did a combination of this kind of in-depth, longitudinal study of what was going on at Stroud and following them over time. And in fact, we're, we're still going with Stroud to this day. And then also these international case studies to say, okay, well, what lessons can we, we learn from them? And then what we did is sort of then take that kind of macro analysis and, and really drop it back into that framework of those different types of skill. But I think some of the broad, very broad brush conclusions of the, of the project was um, past policy initiatives have maybe overemphasized the skills themselves, and particularly maybe the specific skills in the middle there. They've said, OK, if a, if a sustainability initiative works in one town, you know, what skills do we need to kind of pick up and transfer to somebody else? And, and there's been a lot of sort of emphasis on the idea of skills transfer as teaching and learning, as sitting people down and telling them about how to do things. And I think what the project found was that, that really it's, it was the how people learn was very important, that the process of learning was important, the kind of learning by doing, finding their own way through things. And then also these three dimensions of time, people, and place were very important. People were very important, that some initiatives really succeeded because of the individuals behind them. And to think that you could maybe pick those up, those initiatives up, and transfer them somewhere else just as a kind of skills transfer process didn't work because they were very dependent on having the right people. Um, sometimes it was to do with place, and that some places had a stronger sense of place, of being a community, and that made it easier to get people behind a particular local initiative. And then time was very important, either in terms of people having the time to, to dedicate to making the thing work, or also getting initiatives launched at the right time. Some things were seen as having failed just because they were maybe ahead of their time, or they missed the boat. So, so time, people, and place were very important factors in those those different initiatives succeeding, as well as having the right skills mix, both technical skills and those more strategic skills. So what we did with all that, we, we took it all together and we turned it into a little interactive community thing that people can go and explore and click around on and find the, the, the lessons learned from all these different projects. So if you go onto the Brass website, you'll find this little kind of picture of a little community which you can click on. It'll take you into um, exploring all this different information. It, and it, look, it looks like that. And it actually is slightly like the buses do go along the road and the cows wander about in the field and the little footballers just go backwards and forwards endlessly in this endless game that nobody wins um, over time. And then you can click on the different types of building and they will give you different types of... Uh, so if you, if you click on the, on the, uh, uh, the sort of community centre, you'll get community involvement. Same if you click on the business there, you'll get community involvement um, for, for businesses. Uh, if you click on the fields, you'll get food and so on. And so, for, so, so if you click over there, you get community engagement. And just to just give you one example, just to, to, to show you, if you click then on one of the options that comes up is, uh, is um, different projects. This one is Free Geek from Port Portland, USA. Um, and then it goes through the history of the case, the lessons to be learned, um, and what maybe it tells us about the skills mix that was needed to make that particular initiative succeed. And for some reason, actually, I don't know if it's the news at the moment, I kept wanting to type free Greek. I had to have about three, I had to have about three goes at this slide. Something might be Freudian due to what's going on at the moment in the news. Free, free geek, not Greek, uh, bridging the skills gap. Um, again, a social enterprise, free geek, set up in, in the year 2000 in Portland, Oregon, um, with the idea of recycling electronics, particularly IT equipment, PCs, and such like. Uh, I love the mission. It's one of my favorite mission statements ever. Helping the needy get nerdy. I think yeah, that's just a great. That's just a great mission. Um, and the the idea is to stop computers going to landfill, um, and by diverting the stuff, reconditioning it, recycling it, um, and you know, creating new computers from old sort of thing. They're providing low cost or no cost IT training for the people who are involved in the social enterprise. But then that technology goes back into the community. Sometimes at no profit, sometimes at a small profit. Um, it, it relies on donations, so it takes stuff from businesses and individuals from quite a wide geographical range around, um, and then almost trains people on the job to actually disassemble the computers, build them back into new ones, test particular um, components, for example. Um, and they're, they're mostly either low-wage earners or people who are long-term unemployed who you know, act as volunteers within the business. So in some ways, it's quite a low-cost business model in that sense. Um, it's a very interesting for the way it's run. I mean, because I mean, some social enterprises can be quite autocratic if they're run by a very charismatic founder. But this, they, they aim for a very democratically run, non-hierarchical, very open. They have a little, they have their own wiki so that everybody can make their own um, opinions uh, heard on decisions and such like. So it's a very kind of a, a nice new agey kind of business in that sense. 
Um, and, and it's quite nice in that if you look at the, you know, it is very good in terms of sustainability because the benefits it brings to the, the community, they're environmental by preventing this stuff going to landfill, social in terms of um, providing opportunities for the long-term unemployed, and also low-cost computer equipment to people who maybe couldn't otherwise afford it. Uh, and it's economic because, you know, it does bring wealth back into the econ local economy. So in terms of, you know, how does our case analysis look at the skills lessons from that particular case? Because there's all sorts of different lessons you could draw from it. Well, partly it shows that, you know, the importance of technical skills, and it's not just the obvious ones of making sure that people know how to disassemble a computer and put it back together. Um, for example, people are, are, are taught to analyze the market prices for things like metals and parts, so they know whether it's cost effective to rebuild a particular component or turn it into scrap. Um, it was very much based on entrepreneurial skills. It's a, it's a social enterprise, it's entrepreneurial, um, it was effectively a new business model. Uh, it found a gap in the market and exploited it. And once it was established, it looked to then exploit it it's to expand itself through franchising. So there are some very entrepreneurial skills behind the success story. Um, also, people skills. They looked to, to create um, you know, a strong culture with this very open, democratic, non-hierarchical um, internal culture, which they pushed. And they tried to, to get people not just to say, oh, this is an opportunity for me, but this is, a, this is an enterprise worth uh, buying into in terms of my time and my effort because it is good in terms of its sustainability performance. Um, and then also policy and networking skills. I mean, it's interesting because the area they collect stuff from goes, goes across states and the, the, the United States um, have different laws, for example, on treatment of electronic waste. So they had to be quite savvy about understanding the regulations across different states, uh, working with policymakers, working with business organizations as well to develop those networks to make sure you know, that if a big corporate client was getting rid of all their computers somewhere in the, in the neighborhood, you know, they would get them. So there, there was quite a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on and also exploiting the grant system locally to try and get some support with, with getting set up for their, their sort of work integration role. So again, you, know, you can look at that and say, it was quite a simple story on one hand, but once you start to unpick it and think about these different types of skill that are actually behind the success story, um, you know, they are quite interesting to, to see that they're, 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 there's a different set of skills that, that lay behind the success. And although you say, okay, there was one founder set it up, you think Free Geek is probably a model that could be picked up and applied elsewhere, I think because you know, its success has been well analyzed and well understood. In terms of the overall project, the whole thing of doing this whole sustainability community, sustainable communities project, you know, what were the big sort of answers that we, we came through with in terms of insights? Well, I think in terms of, as, I, as I've mentioned, it, the process of learning, you know, how the learning of skills is, is tackled within sustainable communities was very important. And I think you know, too much emphasis on learning as sort of information and knowledge transmission um, was often a stumbling block with some projects. That the other ones that, that actually looked at more involvement, uh, more practical learning, more learning by doing were the ones that seemed to succeed and thrive more often. Um, the importance of extending these, these initiatives beyond what we call the usual suspects. I mean, Stroud, they kind of hit a barrier with some of the schemes. They reach a critical mass of all the people who are really into the whole sustainability thing were bought in, but the kind of relatively disinterested mass of the population were just not that interested. And in fact, we've been working with them for the last year or so. Um, they've got a sustainable food project going. And the idea is to take locally grown, relatively sustainable, healthy food and, and sell it out into the poorer communities. Um, who would really benefit from it in terms of health. The stuff is not particularly high cost, they've kept the cost down, but they're trying to get the buy-in from the locals. So rather than go to the local supermarket, use this, this food scheme. And they found it a real struggle to recruit the numbers they need. So I mean, we're working with them to help them with this idea of how do you get it beyond the usual suspects. And then also there's this idea of, of championing, that often it was uh, that where particular initiatives were championed, where it linked into the sense of place, where people thought, well, I'm proud to be part of this you know, let's say it's a fair trade town movement, and they thought well, that's part of what I think my town should stand for, and therefore, you know, I want to be part of it. So this this idea of, of, of tapping into those kind of beliefs, that sense of community, that sense of place, again, seemed to underpin a lot of the very successful projects. And as, as I say, a lot of the success was not just about having the right skills and the right knowledge, but also making sure that the action to develop those was taken you know, at the right time and via the right people. Why is all this so important? Well, I think part of it is because of what we're facing um, in the future. And, and if you haven't already seen it, I'd recommend this to you, Wales in the Energy Crunch, um, developed by our, our colleague, Calvin Jones, who's really looked sort of 20 years into the future, taking the, you know, really the best science we have about what are the future energy supplies gonna be like? 
what are the likely um, implications going to be in terms of cost and availability? Um, and really, you know, it, it's quite grim, but very well researched reading. Um, and I think it shows you that the lifestyles we've had, the economies we've had, the communities we've had up till now are not sustainable, just in terms of the cheap energy will not be there in 20 years. And we're facing a period of transition, whether we like it or not. And in many ways, you know, it's going to be communities that understand that and I think start to make those adaptations and transitions early that are going to be the ones who maybe have the opportunity to insulate themselves most from disruptive climate change. Um, and I think really what it, me what it means is, you know, we need to start thinking about how do we generate um, low carbon behaviours in all aspects of our communities, whether it's food, whether it's transport, whether it's household management, um, across the board um, as soon as possible. And you know, I think it, it, it's going to be interesting times, um, but I think there's going to be a lot of scope for innovation. And I think, you know, there's going to be opportunities to develop those more reliant, more self-reliant, more resilient, um, and more sustainable communities. Um, I think, you know, looking at something like Free Geek, you know, these innovative business models, different ways of doing business to the ways that maybe dominated the last 20 or 30 years, you know, new types of technology, new types of partnership emerging to try and meet some of these challenges. Um, I think entrepreneurial opportunities will arise and that, that, and that in terms of you know, new markets, new types of business. Will be, will, and uh, hopefully um, we'll have the political will to do it. Um, we'll have the innovative thinking. We'll have the research evidence um, to win the arguments to take those decisions forward and move forward. Um, something that both Brass and Place are very much hoping to play a part. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>